Hello, Brad here, just to say we're super proud that the Friday 5pm podcast is sponsored by the Malt Miller, the UK's best home brew store. We use the Malt Miller for all of our homebrew experiments, as well as tapping them up for advice and binging on their awesome YouTube channel all the time. That's why whenever we release a homebrew video, we put a recipe kit live on the Malt Miller, so you can brew with the exact same amazing ingredients that we did. The same ingredients used by pro brewers. So alongside the malt miller's nitro flushed hops, cold stored yeast and milled to order malts, you can pick up recipe kits for our Five Points Best Bitter, Russian River West Coast IPA and now the fastest beer in the world, a hazy session IPA that goes from grain to glass in less than 48 hours. Sign up to their newsletter at tinyurl.com forward slash malt miller to get 5% off your first order. With the Malt Miller's amazing customer service and Johnny's 48-hour recipe, you could order the ingredients on a Monday and be drinking the beer by the weekend. Speaking of which, it's Friday. It's 5pm. So enjoy this week's Friday 5pm podcast. Hey everyone and welcome to a special and unusual episode of The Bubble. Not only am I going off script, I'm also solo for this particular effort for reasons that um, will become clear as we get further into this Mark Maron style uh, soliloquy that will start this podcast. So today's guest is somebody who... uh, He's never met me and we still never met. We did this over Zoom, but who is... uh, a very special person to me and who helped me through a very dark time. Um, so back in 2010, I was a budding journalist, uh, a budding music journalist. I was trying to make my way into the incredibly, incredibly competitive world of music journalism. And I was doing a work placement, a work experience placement at Mojo magazine. Now, mostly these work placements are a bit of a waste of time, but actually Mojo treated me extremely well. I got to interview Tracy Thorne and ask her what her favourite song to sing in the shower was. That was a pretty surreal uh, surreal moment. Um, I also got to write lots of reviews and was commissioned to do a feature all about great new music videos. So as part of that, I was sort of sent off and, and put in a desk in the corner to do some research and to look out for new video releases. And while I was doing that, I came across a song called Nothing Like You by a band called Frightened Rabbit. And I'd never heard of Frightened Rabbit until this point, uh, even though it was actually their third album that Nothing Like You came off of. Um, and I was blown away by the, th- by the song. I thought it was absolutely amazing. Um, it was also the same day that I discovered The Nationals. So it was a big day for me, uh, basically discovering my two favourite bands in one day. But Nothing Like You led me to listen to the full album, The Winter of Mixed Drinks, which came back to rescue me from a very dark period in my life around 2010, 2011, when I was really struggling with my mental health, with some personal situations that were going on. And that album, it was it was a metaphorical crutch. It, it kept me upright when all I wanted to do was, was lie down and forget about the world. And um, even now, when I listen to it, it's one of those albums that for me just transports me directly back to where I was living in in North London, to the the weather at the time, to the food that I ate, the drinks that I drank, the feelings that I was feeling, the places that I was going. You just, I just immediately relive that when I listen to that album. Um, and what's remarkable about that is that that's not even my favorite album by Frightened Rabbit anymore. My favorite was the album before that called Midnight Organ Fight, um, and that album. Uh, I've put a link in the show notes too, because I think if you've got time, the best thing to do is to listen to that album before you listen to the interview today, because not only is it one of the greatest albums written this century, it is one of the most powerful um, and emotionally raw bits of music ever written, I think. And while um, a lot of that is put down, obviously, to the amazing um, voice and lyrics and, and songwriting of Scott Hutchison. As I say in this interview, a lot of it also comes from Grant, his brother, who was the drummer. Um, and the way that, that his approach to music and his background in drumming led this almost like pulsating fast blood beat to a lot of the music that Scott was writing. Now, in 2018, tragically, Scott, the singer of the band, took his own life which left Grant um, obviously absolutely devastated and millions of other fans devastated as well. Um, and it also left Grant with a choice to make about the rest of his career. And he, he did some band management, he did some, some session playing, but actually it was a great love of his that had been forming while he was in the band that he turned to for a new career, and that was Cider. 
So Grant is a, a, a cider geek and he's founded his own wholesale business as well as a charity in, in the memory of Scott. And that's basically what we talk about today. We talk about his time in the band and the, you know, the highs and the lows of being being in a, a you know, a cult band, one that has a, like me, a, a, a very, very adoring fan base. Sorry, not like me. I don't have that fan base. I mean, I was part of their adoring fan base, but also not seeing, you know, financial commercial success on on the scale that perhaps the music deserved definitely the music deserved um so we talk about that we talk about his role as the drummer um i play a bit of drums um and i've always loved loved him as as a drummer and then we talk about um everything that happened around scott's death so around scott's mental health grant's mental health around um you know the changes that he had to make to his life the foundation of the charity and then of course his new venture uh, as a, a natural cider wholesaler um so it's a bit of an unusual bubble episode usually we talk to people within beer about their passions outside beer or we talk to people outside beer about uh, the beer industry today we're doing all of that combined into into one i think um really insightful and, and compelling story and grant um i have to thank him for being so incredibly honest and open and up for this conversation There'll be moments that I'll be taking away to think about, I think, for a, a good couple of weeks. And I hope that the same is is true for you guys, whether it's it's, it's about the music um, or the dark times that followed or whether it's about this uh, new world and, you know, these wonderful um, little threads that he pulls to to bring the, the world of natural cider and, and, you know, his old job of, of beautiful music together. So, yeah, that's the end of my Mark Maron impersonation um what follows now is a, a lovely interview with the amazing drummer charity founder and now uh, natural cider wholesaler grant hutchison oh, i love that stuff and drinking it for years drinking it for years drinking it for years drinking it for years yeah, yeah, yeah. you know i, I moved they recently decided to add more hops to it to it hops to it you know, I, I heard they recently decided to add more hops to it. Just do it. Hops to it. So Grant, thank you so much for taking the time out to to speak to me and to speak to someone who has to admit to be a giant Frightened Rabbits fan. Um, I guess the, the best place to start would be perhaps for people who never came across Frightened Rabbit. Um, would you be able to sort of describe what what Frightened Rabbit was and what their their kind of their sound was for those that that haven't heard it? Yeah, um, so it was started from the very beginnings was was Scott, my brother, um, who who at the at the time was was it was in art school or just finished art school. I forget the exact timing of it, but you know um, it was thought or understood that he'd probably do visual art um and then it turns out he'd been writing songs and um and and singing on them as well which was something that i'd never heard him do before um, <laughs> it was a complete surprise was it i yeah he, he was he, obviously he played guitar for years um but in his sort of high school band and uh, he was he was the guitarist didn't ever sing so so this was the first time i'd heard him sing was when he gave me demos to listen to i think i think if I'm being honest, probably because I was the only drummer he knew rather than the best one or the most appropriate one. It was just a case of, well, you're my brother, you play the drums, you'd probably be pissed off if I didn't ask you to join this band. So, um, <laughs> so, so yeah, so the two of us played together for, for a short while in Glasgow, various uh, support shows and small venues. And, um, and then we asked uh, Billy to join, became a three piece for a while. Um, and uh, and then Andy and Simon, who 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 joined later, became the kind of five um piece that 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 was that was the lineup when when it ended. Do you, do you remember the first songs that Scott was Scott played you that you know I mean Sing the Grays is I think is very different to where you guys ended up, but it still has this kind of um raw I mean I wouldn't call it Gaelic, but like this uh really raw and emotional power that comes through in every single album was that even clear when it was just him with a, a guitar yeah yeah um i mean the first songs that were on the, the kind of t- tape because we recorded onto like a, a little tascam cassette four track recorder um the first songs that were on there would have been be less rude um 
uh, Fast Blood, which actually ended up being on Midnight Organ Fight. There was a, there was sort of maybe two or three that that could have been on either. Um, uh, but but Be Less Rude was, was was one of the first, and then and then there was a, uh, one one specific song called Soon Go, which ended up I think being a B side. Um, but uh, Be Less Rude was the first one I remember being like, oh wow, this is. Is a real is a real thing, you know. This isn't just, or or it could be a real thing, you know. That it's not just Scott kind of messing about in his in his bedroom, um, or or it could be more than than that, um, and and yeah, I was just kind of blown away. I, I guess as as a lot of people were when they first heard it, at, at whatever stage it was, you know, I was kind of blown away by his lyrics and his songwriting and his honesty and um how how he, he, he kind of got himself across um in in the music in in a in a way that wasn't you know pretentious or or kind of metaphorical or masking anything it was pr- pretty much bearing his his soul um so so yeah i was i was excited from from the beginning felt like it could, it could it, it was something that a lot of people could and would enjoy so i mean frightened rabbit was a reference is that to him being a very shy kid yep that's what uh, our mum used to <laughs> refer to him as when he was sort of you know maybe a, a kind of a uh, toddler preschool kind of age um when when he was sort of thrown into these social situations with other you know our parents friends kids you know um, who 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 generally, you know, at these events, you just could they kind of all club together, go to a room and play, or go outside and play, or you know, you just kind of all hang out together. He would not; he would tend to just cling on to mum and be like, nah. Um. So so yeah. So that kind of came, and and obviously he liked the juxtaposition of this frightened rabbit being on stage, you know, and putting it putting himself out there uh, in a in a very non-frightened way i guess <laughs> yeah i mean that was the indication i got yeah. um but um you you were i guess completely the opposite to to that as a, as a kid that's what you've you've said before yeah d- um, definitely we uh, were always very different um in in terms of our sort of core personality i guess um you know i was far more outgoing um maybe even annoying uh you might say <laughs> um and uh uh and and you know i, I guess kind of like you know a sort of human version of the instrument i played you know um loud big wanted to to get in people's spaces so um so yeah we, we were we were very different um so was it you that came up with the idea I want to play drums, or did did somebody suggest that somebody like you probably should? <laughs> uh, no, no, well, yeah, I mean a bit of both, really. Like my my music teacher uh, at school. So before we before I got to high school, I didn't really played anything. Um, I'd played maybe a bit. Of, I think I played a bit of violin because it was the only thing that you could really that was on offer in primary school. Got to high school, and I just sat down at the drums one day and played and I could do it um and but I st- for some reason I had this f- desire to play the saxophone I have no idea where it came from um but it was there so I went for that audition for the uh, to get lessons for that my music teacher was a bit like yeah I don't think you should I think you should maybe go for the drum one as well and I was like okay I'll do both as a kind of compromise didn't get in, didn't get accepted for saxophone and did for the drums. So I don't know whether she had something to do with that or <laughs> it was just my natural path um, being laid for me. But um, but I I just I just as soon as I started, I just it just felt right. I felt very at ease behind the drum kit. I, I learned quickly and loved it. You know, I played on pillows um, and you know, whatever sort of surfaces I could get to kind of set up this um, uh, drum kit in, in the house before I had one. Um, and then the first opportunity that came, 
to get one was was from the school who, who were selling their old drum kits, and it was a you know it was a piece of shit, but um, it did the job and better than pots and pans and yeah, a little. And... I mean, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so that was my. I bought a drum kit from the school, and, and that was it. Really, played played it played it constantly, um, and just and loved it and played. You know, we had a had a band in high school, playing mainly playing covers. Um, you know, like we we played. I mean, my my proudest one was probably playing. I used to play "Fire" by Jimi Hendrix. It's still one of my favorite drum songs that's ever been written. Um, and uh, used to played that for my for my exam as well. Uh, in in I think fourth year. Um, and we used to play. It was kind of around the sort of emo time. I know a few people are still still in, in that, that time. still in that time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, you know. So we played like um, uh, Jimmy Eat World. Um, we played um, oh, what was that? The At Your Funeral, which was by oh, shit, I can't remember. Um, Less than Jake, we did that. Did, songs by Lesson Jake, Chili Peppers, which is not emo, but it was that kind of era as well. Mm. Um so so quite different from what I eventually started doing with Frightened Rabbit. It was actually a conversation that Scott and I had. I was definitely more rock, you know, um Dave Grohl being a big um influence and idol and and, you know, John Bonham as well. That I think when you're grown up you just you you kind of veer towards the most technical players because mm-hmm. you think that's what makes a good drummer or a good player whatever instrument it is um and that was a conversation that he and I had early on where he was kind of like, no you if if you if you're gonna play on the songs that I'm writing then then you sort of need to unlearn all that um which was was hard to do and you know we we continued to clash when writing and recording right up until the last album we recorded that was just you know being brothers I guess but um, you know I think we sort of pulled each other uh, closer to, to the other one's viewpoint so that it, it worked the dynamic worked really well somewhere in the middle Um mm. I've I've always thought with Frightened Rabbit songs that there was like um it almost felt like sometimes songs could have got a little bit a little bit slower and a little bit less heavy and the drums were always trying to keep that momentum going and Yeah. Um particularly like you talk about like the technical side of drumming. I was the first time I ever heard uh, Modern Leper and that drum beat that comes in that's not on the beat <laughs> that you expect it to be. Yeah. And it's just is that just a little thing you just sort of threw in there because you wanted it to well, be feel a little bit different. Yeah, um, I would kind of write my parts um, to to a, often just an acoustic guitar and a vocal. Certainly, early on, anyway. Um, and Scott, in terms of midnight organ fight stuff, he had a bit, pretty big influence on what was on there because he he had already kind of written a lot of it in his head. Um, but but I could always you know put my spin on it. Um and that song always felt always sounded to me like like a country song almost, you know, and that um uh the just the kind of rhythms that he was playing and I and like I say there was it was it, you know, I was working with a demo, um and then there was that little sort of slide guitar part in there that I don't know whether that came from from the beat that I put on or whether I'd heard that first, I don't really remember, but um it it always and, and I think lyrically as well for me it it's reminded me of of that style, um, a kind of country song, you know, where um, someone's lamenting lost love and blaming themselves, and you know, using dark metaphors and um, and so that kind of offbeat thing, I felt kind of worked, and I think I was probably listening to um, a lot of uh, Johnny Cash at the time as well. Um, mm-hmm. And and yeah, it just it, it, you know a lot of it I can't remember where certain things 
came from or whether there was a reason for it. Um, uh, but I always had to get the green light from him anyway, so <laughs> I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't be too adventurous. <laughs> um, so that that album, uh, Midnight Organ Fight, was, I guess, not the album that, that quite broke you because you know bands are always trying to reach that next sort of level of success i guess but like you mentioned jimmy eat world and i'm pretty sure that one of those guys said they love the album and biffy clyro and death cab for cutie all these and the national of course eventually i don't know whether that was at that point but they all came out saying they love that record yeah is, is that is that a strain it feels like a really strange thing to have heroes you were playing only a couple of years earlier are loving your stuff yeah i mean it was that was the thing it was it was unfortunately more bands seem to like it than people that pay for records. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was, it, you know, it's amazing to get that um, recognition from from people that you know we didn't, we 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 they weren't contemporaries of ours or peers of ours. They they were people we grew up listening to more well not maybe not grew up listening to but certainly when we did midnight organ fight you know hearing that death cab for cutie liked it was like well that you you know you're part of what made that sound the way it sounds you know so to hear that was 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 incredible and then yeah biffy constantly mentioned that you know I, I, whenever they or certainly simon are asked what song do you wish you'd written? He pretty much always says Modern Leper. Um and it's yes, yeah, it's, it's amazing that that so many people in trying to do the same thing had, had so much respect for it and um and and still I still remember to this day getting asked if we wanted to support Death Cab in Europe, um, where I was when that our agent phoned and said that um because that was that was the first you know it's first sort of tour of a decent size that we got and and the fact that it, she'd said oh okay this case, the request came from the band that that you guys support them on this tour um and and that kind of felt like from there sort of felt that like we could we could kind of make something of it hmm so you, I guess you were all working part time or full time still at that point. Yeah, definitely. I had a very understanding boss. Um, I worked at a shop, a deli shop called Peckham's in in Glasgow, and uh, my boss was a big fan of music. He actually had a a Tom Waits um, patch, soul patch, uh, and <laughs> uh, he loved music and and was constantly like, "Well, you know, I just it was at the point where I was like, okay, I need to." You know, every maybe every two or three months, I was needing three weeks off, and it was just kind of as as the the gap between those two or three weeks off uh, lessened, the, that was when the the decision had to be made to say that we need to we need to quit our jobs. But at that time, we weren't making enough money to to actually do that. You know, it's it's a there's this there's always this tipping point in in music when you get if you start doing it professionally the reason you have to start doing it full time is because you don't have the time it's not because you're earning the money um mm. so so there's a leap of faith involved oh 100% um but you know like what what you get from that um in 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 every other aspect of it um is is so so much more than than the money obviously it's eventually you need to get to that point um that it, that it pays the bills otherwise you have to stop and and i know a lot of people that have had to do that and you 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 know especially this year i don't even know how many people have been affected in that way who were maybe just on the cusp of something um but but yeah luckily we didn't have to make that decision to say to stop you know um we were kind of we continued to 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 be able to do it for profit uh, right up until the end which is which is amazing and I, and I feel really lucky to to be able to say that yeah it's it's a terrifying thought to think about all the stories 
we'll never hear about the bands that never quite made it and all the music that won't get written as a result of of what's happened in the last year yeah but then there'll be there'll be the flip side of that where there'll be so many who who have you know the, where where this has caused them to create music mm-hmm. um or it's given people a chance to step back um and maybe not make decisions that uh that might not have helped them you know i think that yes that that's a totally true statement to say but i think there'll be as many there'll be as many people that that coming out of this might um might have benefited um creatively um but it's just it's more the the kind of state yeah this the state of the whole industry is is in total free fall at the moment so <laughs> I, yeah. I don't know what I don't know what the future is is like for 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 music and and specifically live music and that's where you know the hard thing is that that's where people artists and bands who are who are at that point live is 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 your lifeline you know um both financially and uh and emotionally you know it ke- keeps you connected to your audience in a in in a much more real way than than doing that online um and and as i said it also that's where you get paid you know people don't buy records anymore so uh you don't you don't make money from necessarily releasing music or putting it on spotify you have to go out and play it to people and sell merch on top of that you know that's the kind of grim reality Mm. So you mentioned about sort of live being the most important thing. And I, I think I saw you guys probably seven or eight times. Um, and then one time in a shop in central London, uh, I think it was just Scott and maybe Billy just playing mm-hmm. to a bunch of people who got a mail out. Um, and I was always struck by um, how visceral a lot of the the songs were and how they got you know, you guys love to extend the ending to make them bigger and heavier and, and to play around with them musically and um, create something that was quite different to what was on on record and particularly Scott at the front really bearing himself. What, I was When I used to watch it, I, I'd wonder what it was like to be a brother stood behind him for so many gigs watching him sort of bear his soul and and how comfortable that was to watch, I guess, from, from behind. Uh, generally on stage it was fine you step into a kind of different mode to do that um so you know scott became not a, not a different person you know because he was definitely himself on stage but he he was a sh- he was a showman you know and, and uh, that was a very big part of it um you know what i find harder to watch was after shows or just downtime on tour knowing he was struggling with his mental health and uh struggling with you know alcohol as well was another thing um uh, so so being on stage was actually where it, it felt you know the most the, the happiest or where he and I felt I felt more most connected to him. Um mm-hmm. certainly uh latterly, um that was true. Uh you know, and and it it was a place where you you know conversation wasn't an issue or a thing, you know, we didn't you could put everything aside, um, whatever was happening personally or in the background um could be put aside for for this for the show um and and we could concentrate on everyone out there rather than the people on stage mm-hmm. it, it felt like uh, some of the later albums were much much less about his personal life and more about some social commentary particularly painting for panic attack and stuff like that was that a deliberate choice made by him or by the band or just the way that the songwriting went yeah it was it was a it was a deliberate choice made by him um uh i think he he tried to go even further with it 
on painting of a panic attack and in the end it was me who had to kind of pull him back and say that you, you can't take yourself right out of this because people won't connect to it you know um that you and your lyrics and your stories are the reason people are here and if you take that out of it it's not it's not frightened rabbit anymore or it's not real anymore and and i personally even would 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 question that decision um of a band that i loved um so 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 he did kind of, for panic attack he did kind of pull it back and and um wrote a lot more about himself but i think you know i think that the reality or the truth of it is that he was in he was in a dark place and didn't want to write about it or didn't want people to know about it I was trying to to keep that back and whether that was um for for fear of you know vulnerability um or or for fear of everyone knowing how he felt um i'm i'm not sure you know um i never kind of got that out of him um but you know he, he he wasn't in a good place and you can you know that album it doesn't have the moments of light to to balance out the dark that that was was always scott's style <laughs> um from the very beginning you know and it it was and I think that's down to the fact he didn't have that in his life. You know, he didn't have those moments, and and that's obvious. Um, with 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 what happened, you know, with with um, with how he 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 lost his battle with with depression and, and anxiety, and um, you know, that's an album that I've I've not gone back and listened to a lot of our stuff, but that's one that I probably will avoid for a very long time. Um, because it's. For me, it's you know, it's partly it's it's just very hard to listen to, but also there's the kind of the guilt attached to it for me that you know was he was obviously trying to at times trying to say something and and uh, try and cry a cry for help, I guess. Um, so, um. So yeah, I think he he tried to move away from from telling his own stories, but you know, like I said, that's why people were there, and that's what people loved about him and and us. Yeah, I think. Well, I, I presume that would have been borne out in the reaction um, after he died. To like, I just saw on on every social media that I went on was just endless people. Like, I went there to say, you know, um, rest in peace, Scott. Like, you were so important to me the music you wrote, the lyrics you wrote, and to see those light moments that you had gave me hope when I was feeling bad. Um, and I went to say that and just everybody else was saying it already. It was just a incredible outpouring of people going, you were sort of a crutch to me. Um, yeah. With yeah. Um, that was written. And I think, you know, that was something that was a kind of, I guess, it was hard for him to... to um, to come to terms with that, yes, it was great that people had had taken those songs and it helped them a lot. But but there was also, I think, on top of that, a pressure that he felt to continue doing that or to be some kind of therapy for people. And that, um, and as I said earlier, like what I said to him when I said, well, you know, this people are there here for you, you know, um, I think that's something that he, he, as well as feeling immensely proud of, there was the, the, the kind of, the, the pressure there, um, that he was some kind of, uh, that, that listening to our band was some kind of therapy or catharsis for, for, for people who were going through this similar thing. Um, and yeah, I mean, after after he died, the the reaction, the the um, the kind of outpouring of grief was pretty overwhelming, to be honest, for 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 me and for 
the band and, and the family you know even even someone who'd seen it you know had been had been part of the band and, and the good side of it and seen the, the, the every venue and tour that we did you know and I was aware of where the band were positioned I still was kind of taken aback by how far we'd reached and how deeply he'd connected with people um and also it was re- what was nice about it or comforting was that uh, I was hearing or reading all these stories from people about little moments that I didn't know about you know that um he'd he'd maybe done uh done something a sort of random act of kindness for a fan you know sent sent them something in the post because they messaged on twitter saying they were having a shit time or got people into gigs because they just didn't buy a ticket you know and my reaction to those people would probably be well you didn't buy a ticket so you don't get in you know that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's how going to a gig works man that's how it works. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um but that's that wasn't him he was much kinder than me like um and uh, and and those little stories that came out, people were posting little notes that he'd, he'd written them and things, and that was really beautiful and, and sad as well, you know, because knowing how many people he helped uh, around the world uh, and sitting there with the fact that he couldn't help himself or I and others around him couldn't help him was, was also devastating. Hmm. I think I think that's where a lot of the shock came from, but I think everybody everybody's been in that position knows that it can go one of two ways, and and often it's not really up to anybody around them. Um, yeah, I know. Um, it's a it's a. I think I've I've been through kind of every emotion or every stage of grief m- multiple times. You know, with 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 suicide, it's. It's a very different process of grief and, and isn't as linear as, as it as it can be in in other instances and um because things just keep coming back. Um that from from his life, from my life, um uh, and and it can just you can you can be on this sort of well, you can be on this positive path or um, feeling better, and then all of a sudden something just kicks you right back to the beginning, um, and and you and you have to go through it all again. And um, it's you know, I'm I'm aware we're still you know we'll be we'll be three years this May since since Scott died, and that's still not very long, you know. Um, so it's not that you know I expected to be anywhere. Um, in terms of my my emotional reaction to it, um, uh, it, because there's just there's still so much that that will happen that that will will change how I feel. You know, I've had a had a daughter last year, and um, even that event, something that is incredibly joyful and um, incredible, is. You know, it's still it's it's going to be tinged with a bit of sadness. You know, mm-hmm. she's not going to meet her uncle Scott, and uh, and now it's at the moment there's sort of small things where she's you know she's doing little things that you would send pictures to to him or you know, and there's always something that's just gonna uh, just gonna come out of nowhere really, um, and and take you right back to where you were when when it when it first happened, even even having worked through um various emotions and reasons for feeling a certain way um it's it's so back and forth every day so what what was it like to to work on so it was it was going to be the 10 year anniversary of midnight organ fight um was it 2018 or was it 2019 18 yeah 2018 18. so that album scott scott did work on that did he he was part of that the covers, the covers yeah. record, yeah, yeah, yeah. He teared every single thing that was on it. Um, it was it was ready for release 
basically. Mm-hmm. The, the, uh, he and the, the guy that he worked with on the artwork for, for all the records, they were just about to kind of start that process. So in terms of the music, yep, yeah, he'd heard everything. He knew everyone that was on it. I mean, it's a remarkable list of people who all clearly loved Frightened Rabbit and wanted to be part of that. And choosing who did each song is just... Um, I mean, some of my favourite covers are on that album now and it was brilliantly done, I think. Um, but I guess our, what, releasing it then felt very different to how it was intended. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Um, yes, I know. Uh, it, 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 there was no way getting, of getting around the fact that it would be received differently. But at, at the end of the day, what we wanted it to be from the very moment we thought about it was a celebration of that album and those songs. And it still is that. Um, and, and, and I think that, you know, the fact we ended up obviously not coming out that year for obvious reasons. And, um, and, you know, we, we were quite, we were, we wanted, we were adamant that people knew that Scott had heard everything on it and it wasn't a reaction to his death. It was, um, it was something that was delayed by re- the release was delayed by his death and he, he, he knew everyone that was appearing on it. He, he knew uh, he'd heard all the covers. Um, so, so yeah, it, it definitely became something different, but the fact that it alongside all our other releases will, will last forever means that slowly that kind of connection that people now have to it, that that'll disappear and it'll, it will, you know, just be, become a covers record. If someone comes to that brand new um, in 10, 20 years time, they'll listen to it for what it is, you know, they'll listen to it for as as a as a record of of covers written um by 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 one band um and and we'll take it for that which is mm-hmm. which is is good because you know we didn't that was a difficult thing we didn't want it to be a kind of you know in memory or um anything like that it was it, it, we just wanted people to to enjoy other people's interpretations of their favorite songs um and and i think that's on the whole that was that was the kind of the feedback we got the reaction we got was that you know um people just just enjoyed it enjoyed the songs and enjoyed the versions and uh, and also i think what what was quite good about it was that i i well, i heard from a lot of people who said that that was the first sort of their first step back into Frightened Rabbit because they hadn't maybe been able to listen to the band since Scott had died mm-hmm. because they just found it too hard and and um, but that because it was sort of once removed it allowed them to kind of it was a sort of gateway back into listening to to us and listening to him and hearing his voice um, so 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 yeah that you know that was that was kind of one good thing about it but again like I say that won't that won't be the case in in years to come hopefully people just approach it for what it is yeah um so one of the things you did do in his memory was the founding of the charity tiny changes Mm -hmm. um so can can you tell me a bit about that charity and and how people can help i bought one of the football shirts uh, (laughs) myself i did i managed to get one yeah i mean the the whole football thing's hilarious because like scott was <laughs> wasn't really into football. Um, he, you know, if if he was asked, he would say he was a Hearts fan. But um, that kind of all, you know, the connect the connection with the club came about when Scott was still alive, and it was definitely sort of pushed by me more. And he obviously kind of went along with it because he he knew it. Um, that it was quite important to me and. Uh, and also, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, they, we're not really a football-y band, so you know, to be able to kind of tap into that market at the time was was not a, a terrible thing to do. You know, Scott played at Tynecastle when they re when they opened the the new stand, and 
uh, and we're all like standing there like this is just fucking ridiculous <laughs> uh, um but you know but since scott died the, the club have really kind of uh, they've been amazing and they, they've they've kind of taken him on as uh as this kind of um you know um lifelong jambo and um and they've been extremely supportive and uh of the charity as well um so so yeah they, they, so what does the charity do? So the charity is called it's called Tiny Changes. Uh, it's a lyric from from Head Rolls Off. Um, Scott's kind of one of Scott's songs about um, life and and death and um, and what we can do um, for each other and for ourselves whilst we are alive. And um, you know the line is whilst I'm alive, I'll make tiny changes to earth and. Um, when when Scott died, um, it the, the my family and and I felt a kind of urge to to do something to 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 prevent another family going through what we went through. Um, it was just you know I think it goes without saying it was horrendous, but um. It's just so much more to it um, um, that that we we when we, it was specifically my mum who who kind of said, you know what what about what about those families in the week since Scott died who have gone through the same thing as us but don't have thousands of fans or um, the opportunity to get straight on to reporting Scotland to make a put a call out for Scott when he's still missing and uh, and and after he was found the you know most families just have to get on with it themselves you know whereas we still had this this legion of people offering help and offering to set up funding pages and just you know it, which is great but you know mum, mum's thought was well what well, what's there for people who who don't have that and 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 we just felt we had to do something about it um and uh we we pretty quickly settled on a mental health charity being the the focus that we would we would um have and then within that children and young people because um there's there's not there's just not enough support research funding out there for children and young people with with mental health issues uh and and also it's we felt it was a, it was an area that a lot of people um could would 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 relate to or or understand or um anyone who's gone through puberty or gone through high school or has kids or who's friends of kids or um uh, have nieces and nephews you know they they they'll know how vulnerable they can be and um and you'll know yourself as i said having gone through puberty gone through high school the the, the emotions that are flying around are, are are quite hard to comprehend a lot of the time and and um i think even more so even than when i was at school which was you know 20 years ago um in being in high school it's different now the pressures i think have increased uh bullying much like everything else has also moved online and and <laughs> bullying has gone digital yeah good bullying's gone digital and it's it's awful you know because bullies are you know and, and having you know i'll admit myself i um was was guilty of being being a bully in in, in primary school and thinking back now like luckily i got i got someone bit back basically you know um and and that shocked me and uh and and i'm so glad it happened because otherwise i would have continued to be a prick and continued to be a bully and, um and and i know that it was you know uh i was essentially just a coward and that's and that and being able to do that online you know, and, and you don't even you you don't even get the opportunity for someone to to 
bite you back, really. You know, so we 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 were very uh, quickly decided that children and young people needed that help and support, and um, and and we set set up the charity uh, just on the first anniversary of Scott's death, um, and since then it's kind of evolved uh, into into what I think now is is if it's not already it was fast becoming the kind of leading mental health charity for children and, and young people in in the uk i think you guys have done such a fantastic job of 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 getting that message out of there and using that platform that was built um and i i remember thinking when i saw it i couldn't think of a better a, a better way to make use of of that goodwill and of, of scott's memory than than to champion something that he would have cared deeply about yeah that's it i mean he you know everything that we kind of did in the, in the setting up and, and the initial running of the charity was was with him in mind and he still will continue very much to be at the heart of it um but you, you've also got to think okay well, well um we don't want to just reach frightened rabbit fans who want to donate because they love the music we want to reach people who never heard of the band but need help you know um and and that was a kind of one of the first sort of challenges in in the first year was or i guess after the first year cause first year was really like okay let's just let's just raise loads of money we don't have the tools yet um because it was just it was my brother my mum and i who set it up we were the, the we were the board we were we did everything really you know neil, neil uh, my brother was the, kind of he built the whole thing in terms of the structure of it and did all the legal side of it um and then i sort of took on the kind of fundraising and the, the, the kind of public profile of it um so yeah so that was you know straight away we were like okay let's just let's just raise some money direct people people have money they're constantly asking where should, where should i donate to what charity should i donate to um so we set that up and just and just got funds in and then slowly have, have kind of um figured out where best to take it um and 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 who's best equipped to to run it um and and now it's 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 working you know as as a, a fully functioning charity and then it was started you know uh giving grants out um which was you know it's great to see that come into fruition from from the point of neil mum and i sitting in there in my kitchen trying to figure out what we should do um and it's you know uh it it'd be lovely to get to a point where it doesn't need to exist um mm. and um but you know i think again that that would be a big change, not a tiny change. Uh, I think. Yeah, but you know, like that's the the kind of that is the 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 ethos of the tiny changes. You know, motto is is that the, all these tiny changes will create big change and big shifts. Um, you just just not putting pressure on yourself to do too much or or think that you can change the world in with with you know one tweet or one post online or you know one running one marathon that's those are very very important parts of the bigger picture and and if if we bring all that together um then we there's no reason why we can't you know make some pretty serious changes um so uh obviously a lot of aside from setting setting up the charity you you suddenly like you didn't you didn't have the band anymore so you had to make a shift in your career yeah. um which is how we ended up connected because you you started a podcast with uh somebody i know um and you started a business it's very much in my world so where did the the love of cider and when did the love of cider come come into your life and turn into a job um well the love the love came from very you know when i when i started drinking very early on you know i I, uh drank in pubs where uh beer and cider was was an offer on tap and i never really enjoyed beer so 
gravitate towards cider fell heavy for the Magnus effect when that that came out that it summer. It was a heavy time, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when it when the sun shone every day and people sat drinking around picnic tables under uh, apple trees. Um, but uh, and and then I, when I worked in the shop I mentioned earlier, Peckham's, they stocked uh, Dunkertons, and that was the sort of first cider I'd had that didn't taste quite the same as all the other ones. Um, and from there, it sort of developed through touring with the with the band, where every time I went to Bristol, um, when we played there, I'd go to the, to the, the Bristol cider shop, um, when it was still on like the Christmas steps, and I would just fill, um, fill a bag and and uh, come back up with with all these different ciders that again tasted nothing like what I thought cider was. Um, and from there, yeah, that just kind of snowballed. You know, when we toured the US, there's a great scene out there for cider, and um, again, not it's not like really super easy to find, but I would always seek it out and again bring back as much as I could or um, drink as did, much. Did, as I could. did you ever use a rider, to, a very niche cider rider? <laughs> nah, you could, I couldn't. I mean, I did have. There was it was it like this, the rider said no strongbow and no magners laterally. So what I would tend to get would be would be westons, uh, right. which is great, but it's eight point two percent. So <laughs> like, and I I to I maybe sort of four years before or five years before the end of the band, I already stopped drinking before shows. Um, it's just something that I I think I did as a sort of challenge one tour and actually was like, oh shit, this is I'm way <laughs> this more. This is much easier. <laughs> this is, well, it just was, I just way more focused and way more on it. And, you know, I, ne- I would never get really drunk anyway. So it wasn't like, um, I was getting smashed and then going on stage and I had to stop doing that. It wasn't that at all. I, I would have maybe two or three to, to what I, what I would describe as to loosen myself off. And, um, but then, you know, you would drink throughout the show, so by the end of it, again, I wouldn't be smashed, but I'd be a bit pissed, and and uh, I just sort of realised, okay, if, let's not drink before the show, go on sober, have a couple throughout the show, and then afterwards I can sort of um, I can do what I want. But the, but yeah, Westons was the was the generally the the rider drink of choice, or or in the US we used we used to get. Um, down east a lot it's a boston cider company um that we kind of got got to know them um and they would always send us some slabs of of cider um so yeah and then i met gabe who who i think is a you the our mutual contact mutual friend who does the podcast with me um uh Met him shortly after Scott died. Actually, it was only a month and a half after. It was my birthday. I went down to Bristol, and uh, my now wife had, had arranged a, a tour with him around Bristol, like cider tour. Um, and we just really hit it off, got on really well. I think Jay was a bit like, "Should I just leave? You guys wanna just hang out for the day?" <laughs> um, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, with this and, very tall mustachioed lovely man yes yeah um so <laughs> we uh, um from from the moment i met him i you know we just kept in touch and he put me in touch with a lot of people and told me about a lot of different new ciders and uh that was kind of when i realized that, oh i could this could be my new career this could be my new job it's a real passion of mine similar to music um and you know I, i'd felt pretty sh- I'd, I'd done. I'd played a little bit uh, with this Australian artist a um, couple of times that year, and um, and I did a bit of tour managing with friends' band, um, the Twilight Sad, uh, and and I just I, I just quite quickly f- didn't feel the connection to music or the music industry as I had before and uh you know it's something I might go back to but um it, 
it just felt right to make this complete uh, right turn or left turn and and just and, and try something completely new, which which I did. I mean, it's pretty. I don't know if it's the wisest time to start a, a distribution company for cider, sort of in the lead up to Brexit and not obviously not knowing there was going to be a pandemic, but. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been pretty challenging, <laughs> but it's been it's been good. Like, it's been a steep learning curve, and uh, you know, with with the band, we we built that from from the ground up ourselves as well. So that wasn't that daunting to me. I was kind of like, well, you know, I'll give it a go, and if it doesn't work out, I'll try something else. But I mean, we were chatting before we started recording about how suddenly you have a day to day. What was that adaptation about and then a day-to-day with covid where you don't go anywhere pretty much yeah um i mean i guess i was still still working for myself so it wasn't you know it wasn't a kind of nine to five um go to the office and uh start uh crunching numbers or anything um but it definitely certainly was you know uh, set, setting up a business and you know doing because even even with with Threaten Rabbit, um, throughout we had people who worked for us pretty pretty quickly. You know, I'm certainly a manager that would deal with a lot of admin, and then um, you get an agent that starts booking your shows, and, and an accountant comes on board, and all that. And towards the end, you know that that's kind of the goal, I guess, when you start a band, or or when you, your band starts doing well, is that okay, you want to get to a point where all you do is be the person in the band whatever your role is in the band, that's what you do. Um so so with the the business it was like, okay, I need to I need to do accounts and I need to do um invoices and I am um, like, you know, get the logo sorted and get a website sorted and things. So um it was it was yeah, I learned a lot in in a pretty short space of time. Um but the cider industry man, it's super friendly. Way friendlier than the music industry. Um, and I just got so much support and help from people, um, who, who, you know, I guess wanted, to, so I, I, the the business I set up is distribution for cider makers. So I'm, I do wholesale distribution, um, and I buy directly from, from the makers and then, and then try and get it stocked in, um, in retail and, and hospitality. Um, so, so I guess starting that, obviously you're going to have makers who are like, oh yeah, cool. Definitely. That sounds like something that, um, I want to support if you're going (laughs) to sell my stuff for me. So, um, but yeah, I got a lot of, a lot of help, a lot of support. Um, but it was, it was, and has been and continues to be very different, um, from, from life before, but the, you know, we could go into the the difficulties of of the the lifestyle of a musician, um, if if we wanted, but we probably don't have time. But the the you know the the highs and lows and the tour life versus the life at home was was you know a lot to handle mentally. Um, so it feels far more stable, um, and and you're almost not in. You're almost not really in control of your own um, future with with music. You know, yes, you you write the songs, release them, and and if if they're shit, then it's your fault. But um, but there's no telling whether your album's going to go down well, and you're you're only as good as your last one. So um, you know, you're you're um, constantly working to a kind of year and a half cycle of whether or not you'll still have work <laughs> yeah um, although i guess to some extent cider makers themselves might say a similar thing in that they're particularly with natural cider relying on on nature and hoping that they're presented with stuff they can blend and make a success totally that's why i didn't make it <laughs> it's like it's it's interesting the kind of setup of the industry there are you can draw you can draw a lot of paral- parallels with a lot of businesses, but um, I, I think you know the way I see it is that the the cider makers are are the creators, they're the, they're the bands, they're the musicians, the artists, 
they they create something and then it's you know it's the same as music you don't see the bands then going out and putting it in hmv or hmv it's not even a fucking thing anymore. how old am i like so people will be like what's hmv googling when was this recorded yeah totally <laughs> sorry man that's just my f- yeah uh <laughs> you know what they don't then upload it to spotify uh or get it on apple music you know they have someone that does that for them and um and that's kind of my role i guess is, mm. is distribution in that and and f- it felt like um you know when i as my role is in the band as as the drummer you know musically you're you're kind of that um you, you know what keeps keeps it uh, keeps it ticking ticking over you you're you're you know you you set the groundwork and the foundation for for a song you know live and and you're in complete control and um although most of the audience are not really aware of your presence you know um they're all looking at either the singer or the guitarist or both of them and and that's kind of similar distribution i'm I'm sort of in this role of sitting at the back again um but i've got a lot i've got a lot to do and and um and uh, there are a lot of ways of doing it um and and i uh I just want to share the the great ciders that people are already making um, with as many people as I can. I didn't feel like getting into because a lot of people will say, "Well, why didn't you start making it?" I'm like, "Well, because I, I don't know how." You know, I don't <laughs> know the people that make it now have been making it for years, and 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 it just it felt like to me to start that it would be like starting another band now and and working my way up from. Uh, from the beginning to to somehow hoping that I might get to the point where I can play the Barrowlands again with this new band, or I can make a living out of it, and um, it, it it's I, I might make some cider in the future for myself. Well, I mean, I, ha- I do have some; it's pretty minging, but uh, like, but for me, it's kind of like, okay. I, I I see where I can fit in to this structure, and and that felt like the right place, and it, and it fe- and I feel. I feel good there. I feel like I'm a, a kind of good. I've always been a quite a good kind of go between um, person. Um, don't know if that's a compliment for me or not, but uh. <laughs> you're the guy that no one sees. This, yeah, the middleman. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that just skims money off the top of everything. <laughs> um, you you kind of touched on it, but I had I had one last question I wanted to ask. Um, it's the first time I've ever had the opportunity to ask forgive the term a rock star whether they (laughs) consider like cider producers you know brewers rock stars because there's this whole movement in this industry where we literally see you know people like mckellar or logan plant or evan of the colonel of of being kind of rock stars and we're nervous to meet them and we're amazed when we do did you feel that when you got into the cider industry and were maybe meeting the tom olivers of the cider world 100% one hundred percent. Like, <laughs> there's a photo you can find it on my Instagram of me with Gabe and Tom Oliver on that trip I just spoke about earlier on my birthday. Well, for a start, I, I hadn't met Gabe, so my um, wife and I woke up in the morning. And she was giving me my birthday presents, and one was a card that said, oh, "We're going on a tour with the Siderologist today," and I was like, "Holy shit, that's amazing!" Uh, this guy is uh, you know i've been following him on instagram and facebook and twitter and um i can't remember remember if his book was out at that point but uh i, I knew of him anyway so that that first of all first of all was was a great exciting moment and then when we were sitting there having our first side he was like yeah i think there's because there was a food festival on in in bristol and he's like i think tom oliver's around there like pressing apples or something doing some kind of event thing uh, do you want to go around and meet him? And I was like, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. And then, you know, started thinking, <laughs> so I put, tried to put myself in, in his shoe or, you know, having been in his shoes and being like, hey, don't, don't say anything stupid and don't ask him <laughs> anything geeky or, and he was just so lovely. He gave me a bottle of cider. Um, and he'd, he'd actually mentioned he'd remembered he, the, the, Someone who used to work for for the band had sent me a case of Oliver's after Scott died, um, which was probably the best um, thinking of you sympathy note I got. Um, and 
he, he mentioned that. He's like, oh, yeah, I think, did I not send you, like, a case of ciders? I was like, yeah, oh, yeah, you did, yeah. Because um, we've got Tom and I, Tom works in music as well. Um, yeah, with the... Um, with the Proclaimers. Proclaimers. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Scotland's finest. Uh, <laughs> and so, so you know, we've, we've kind of since uh, spoken a lot about that and we've, kinda, you know, we're, we're sort of... I, I would like to think we're friends now. Um Maybe need to get pissed with them a couple more times, but um, <laughs> but yeah, and no, I they, they, they definitely they, there is that I did feel that, and but then quickly realised how small the cider industry is, and that pretty much anyone can have. Well, you basically you go to Tom Oliver's house to buy a cider if you're local. Um, it's not like you go to Simon Neal's house to buy the latest <laughs> Biffy record, is it? Be although, a long queue, I'd imagine. <laughs> although I'm, sh- well, but I'm sure he probably would, man. He's such a nice guy. He probably would be like, yeah, just come round. Come round the house, I'll sign it for you. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's. I mean, it's it's interesting. That I, I was this, I had the same kind of feeling when Ryan Burke was at Bristol for the Cider Salon from, from Angry Orchard in the US. Um, you know, he's kind of, uh, a cider maker that I'm, I, I really look up to, and um, I think does does incredible ciders. And, and like I said, I don't. It's quite nice, not not, you know. I understand the process of making cider, obviously, but the, there's much like making music. There are techniques and ways that people make it their own. That that they'll kind of. It's not even that they'll keep it to themselves. It's just like no one else can do it. You know. You could try as much as you want to make a Oliver's bottle condition medium dry. You could maybe do the same things that he does, but it it won't be his, you know. Um, and that's you know that's what's so it's, it it makes it the 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 transition for me is you know it's not it's not it's not as quite as different you know as as music. Um, and I still get to drink when I want as well. <laughs> but in a much more, that's the thing, in a much more uh, controlled way, you know, the, the again, the music and drinking is probably, we could probably do a whole another episode on on that and the, the issues around it. But um, but yeah, I, I, the, the cider cider industry has, has been incredibly friendly to me and, and it's it's great to, to have all the, contacts with the rock stars of the cider world I drove over to the Sonic drive-in ordered a jalapeno burger washed it down with beer, 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 beer So I hope you enjoyed that podcast. Like the music of Brighton Rabbit, I think it had its its darkness and its light. But I think those kind of conversations are really important to have in an industry that's even now only just starting to understand the fact that while drinking can be a great boon for mental health, it can also be a real negative. So it's important to talk about these things, even if we're not blaming the alcohol, even if we're not preaching to people, just to be honest and open and to have these conversations. Um, so thank you so much to Grant for being so open and, and talking about that. It it was a real honour to talk to Grant. It was um, all I could do not to really geek out, particularly at the start. Um, so hopefully that that didn't come across. Um, and hopefully you, you, you got a lot from this. It's so wonderful to see how you know, responsible consumption of alcohol can turn lives around and can give somebody, you know, a new direction to go in. And I think that, you know, it's really brilliant that Grant had this this passion that he could 
follow um and i didn't know that gabe was was a huge part of that so um if you don't know gabe if you don't know his book you should pick that up as well i'll put that in the show notes because it's a brilliant book about cider and gabe is an amazing amazing human as well uh the neutral cider hotel which is uh grant and gabe's podcast is also well worth a listen i've enjoyed lots of episodes of that so far it's a relatively new podcast but it's already got a voice um and it's got some really funny moments as well as you as you learn about the cider industry it's a great addition to um to you know what pellicle and goodby hunting and and um the other sort of feature-led ones are doing all that's really left to say, I mean, Grant said everything that I'd have wanted to say in this podcast. So all that's left to say is please do check out the music of Frightened Rabbit. Um, Midnight Organ Fight is just fantastic. Winter of Mixed Drinks, like I say, transports me every time. Um, and the covers album that we talked about at length is also absolutely amazing and has lots of great other Scottish and, and non-Scottish bands like Biffy Clyro, The Twilight Sad. So that's well worth uh, finding on whatever platform you use to listen to your music. Uh, the other thing to do is to have a look at uh, Grant's charity, Grant's family's charity, uh, Tiny Changes. And if you think that that's an important cause, then definitely um, donate if you can, because um, they're already doing some some brilliant work. So I'm going to leave it there. My voice is going hoarse, and that's probably why we have co-hosts on podcasts mostly. So all that's left to say is we'll be back in February with another exciting Feature Bubble episode. And of course, every single Friday, uh, we do the Friday 5pm podcast where we dig down into the video that we did that week uh, on the Craft Beer channel. Uh, if you love what we do, if you love this podcast, please, please, please do subscribe to our Patreon. We're now offering everybody who joins the Patreon, whether it's $1 or 50 access to our Discord forum, which is an amazing uh online online chat room basically full of beer geeks it's non-judgmental everybody's lovely and we talk about homebrewing we talk about the videos we talk about life we talk about beer and food matching about cooking with beer and obviously about cider as well of course so uh please hit that up that's in the show notes as well to join our patreon uh otherwise i will see you guys on friday with my man brad uh for less of a goddamn monologue Oh, I think it's got a yeast infection. Shin, 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 sh